What do you think when you see all the kids up here on Sunday? What do you see? Future. The, it's fun because we get to see kids. We, we know the church isn't dead. Uh, but at Bypass, y'all know we have kids' room. We have a daycare up through you know, two to two, three, and four-year-olds. And so I see the kids when I'm there uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays. Or even when I'm over at Rice, like I was uh, Thursday. There's something about seeing children. I would not be, for Wendy and Amy, I, you don't want to see me in your halls. Okay? Because when they walk down the halls at church, they're trying to teach them what it's going to be like to be in one of their lines. Wendy's line is perfect, right? <laughs> They're fifth graders. They ought to be perfect by then. But they come by our offices there at church, and they're like, shh, y'all don't be talking to the preacher. Y'all be quiet. Stay in line. I'm over there speaking, waving, coming to the door to give high fives. You know, it's rowdy when they go by my office, Okay. Because, see, I see something in those children. I'm always drawn to them. And I think you probably see that one of the coolest things in the world is to see your kids, your kids, your daughter giving me a hug this morning, All right. to see them come, okay? But I see potential. I see, I always wonder, I'm like, what will this child be? What will God call this child to do? In our own life, we, our, our kids are kind of in opposite areas. One's going to be a teacher and artsy out there. I love you. <laughs> and then I have geeky science nerd. <laughs> okay? I talked to him yesterday, too. And I love him in his own special way. But I look at those kids and I wonder what they will be. Because... If I think about what we've been talking about, the spirit calling, the things that we do, I think we're called to. You were called to teach and to love children and to be able to, to interact with in ways that I can't imagine. I cannot imagine, I'm picking on the front row, I can't imagine anybody wanting to work with middle schoolers. Okay? They just wanted to lock me up and see what came out and hope I lived. All right. This one here has a business degree. Why, other than her husband, than getting a husband? I don't know. Because she and I have the same degree and she got a husband out of it. You learned a lot. You were a good student, a better student than I was. Okay, but she should be a teacher. And that's why she's in the schools. It's her love for kids. And so when I see the kids on, at, at Kids Room, I see them up here or I interact with them, I see what God might call them to be. It's one of those things of always dreaming and seeing. Now, we talk many times about being spirit-led, and we think about, I'm going to go and do this. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the giver of gifts. He is the one who imparts and empowers those things. Your creativity is not because you, I think part of it is our lineage, but it's because the Holy Spirit gave you part of that. Hmm. So we see that in Romans chapter 12. We start seeing how, how the Holy Spirit is working and is giving gifts. Romans chapter 12 verses 3 through, oh me, guess who didn't get his glasses picked up? Three through eight. Put it on the screen, Matt, and I'll cheat. <laughs> For the, by I, the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed to each of you. Don't worry, we're getting to the spiritual gifts, but look who's giving right there. The Holy Spirit is calling 
I'm pointing back there to the screen. In verse 3 at the end of it, it says that you're going to have faith according to how God is giving you faith. He is the giver. He is the one that is distributing. I think in this fallen world we forget that God's calling beforehand. Before we say, I am a child of the King. And it's out of that, His calling, that He enables us to say, yes, I choose you. He's reaching out before we claim. Okay? Just, uh, it starts with Him. I think we have to respond, but it starts with Him. And for just as each of us has one body and many members... And these members do not all have the same function. Think about the children. Not every one of them is going to grow up to be the same thing. I picked on the front row and they're all dealing with kids up here. But in our life, because we don't all have the same function, do we? Not in our life, not in our homes, not in church. He says it takes a group of us to be a body, to be the body of Christ. It says, so in Christ, we though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Hold on, Matt, don't go anywhere. In our individual world, Becky, I bet, doesn't think about belonging to Jeff. You, have a, you work with Jeff, you're, you're close to Jeff, but you don't think about yourself belonging to Jeff as part of the body. More often than not, I, I, I struggle with that concept. But it says when we are part of the body of Christ, and by the way, it goes beyond us just talking about our own little place within the church, that would be the church universal, that Catholic church we said in the creed. It said that we belong to each other as part of the bodies of Christ when I claim who I am. Now, I will tell you we're dysfunctional when we talk about that big body. The big C church, okay? Huh. So that we belong to others. We belong to those around us. That's why when we support each other, when we do things together, we are living out that call. All right, Mac, give me, it's going to take me forever to get to through eight. We have many different gifts according to the grace given to each of you. Again, look, it's grace given, Holy Spirit giving us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to get if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, show it cheerfully. That is not all of the gifts that we see when we do spiritual inventories. It's not all the gifts that God gives us in the myriad of things in how we function. Okay? Most of those that we just read line up from a church concept. Okay? Or we think of them in that way. But the reality is that we are called to use our gifts. And to use them in, abund in abundance and according. No, I'm not going to sing. Do not turn this mic on. When Jeff is standing up here and he was trying to get you to clap... When Jeff was planning worship earlier this week, even when he found out that he was going from the group to solo, Jeff was in his happy place. You were. You were, you were thinking that, how am I going to do this, and is Danny coming or not? But Jeff knows part of who he's called to be. Okay? As when Jeff wasn't leading or involved in worship prior to coming here, it wasn't a happy spot. Okay? We, it, Jeff doesn't know how long we prayed for he and Mary Jo. I didn't know I was praying for Jeff and Mary Jo specifically. I was praying for somebody who was in their happy spot to come and lead worship. Each of us has to find that place where we are to serve God and what that looks like. Each and every one of us 
<coughs> excuse me, has a place that ought to be a good spot. I'm not telling you it's always easy. Jeff's not going to tell you it's always easy, easy to be up here every Sunday. Okay? But Jeff understands his passion. He understands how God is wired him that way. Hmm. Do you know where your happy spot is in serving God? Do you know where that spot is that God says, this is what I have for you. And this is how I'm using it. Danny's brother is, is a retired full elder and bishop of the Methodist Church. He still, when we were visiting with each other, he still enjoys serving. He, can't, he, he doesn't leave, though he's retired, by the way. It does he? I did, from our conversation, the answer to that is no. And each of us ought to have a place that we know this is, uh, that this is how God is using me. That this is a spot that I can use what God has given me, God has blessed me with. And I, I think they do shift some, okay? As we get older, if I said, and I was never great with being a youth person, and I think it has to do with how old I was when I came into ministry, but I, I won't go back there. I can still love college kids, and I can love high schoolers. As I said, I'm not sure about middle schoolers. Okay? I'm assuming grandparents, grandchildren will change that opinion for me at some point. But if I said I was going to go back and my passion would be youth, y'all would be going, we're not sure about that. But we need to find a place where God is using the gifts that we have. Because I look out here, and I, I see all sorts of gifts. For some of you, I don't know exactly. I don't know you well enough. I don't know where you are, and that's, that's okay. What I do know is that we have that peace, that place where we can and should be using our gifts and talents. And it doesn't matter who you are. God's given them to you. And as a child of his, he's asking you to use them. You know, well, John, I just, I just don't know how that's going to work. <clears throat> and like I said, it's not always easy. And so I want to tell you a story of Acts chapter 19. It's Paul, he's going into Ephesus. I'm not going to try to read those verses. I'm going to tell the story. Okay? Paul chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we find Paul having just run from Corinth. Uh, it's typical Paul fashion. He's been run out of town. He's, Paul is not the most um, welcome preacher at some point, almost anywhere he goes. It's actually going to happen at the end of 18, at Ephesus, or 19. But he goes to Ephesus, he, he's left, and Paul is using his gifts. He's doing two things, and he's going to stay here for almost three years at Ephesus. Timothy's with him, by the way. He, he's making tents. That's how he's making a living. And then he's preaching, because that's part of who he is. Okay? And so when he first gets there for about three months, he goes to the temple, and he's asking them, he's like, have y'all received the Holy Spirit? They're like, received What? And he explains to them, he's, he asks, he says, have you been baptized? And they go, yeah, by John. He goes, that's a baptism of repentance. And he baptizes them and the Holy Spirit comes on them. All right. And so how that works, I'm not going to unpack the Holy Spirit forever on the Trinity piece. But all of a sudden, these group, there's 12 guys who understand it. They become baptized and they become his followers. But in the temple, they aren't following. They're like, we don't get it. They're like, we think you're crazy. Paul goes and he says, come on. He takes the 12 and Timothy and a couple of others. And he goes and then for the next two and a half years, he teaches at Ephesus. And the church is born there. Timothy will actually get left there to lead the church at Ephesus. Okay? Because 
he looks around and sometimes we have these callings and these things in our lives and we're like, I don't know how we're going to do this. Paul looks around and he goes, I don't know how we're going to reach Ephesus either. But he said, I got 12 guys who, who grasp it and a couple of others that came with me. So they got 15 of them. We got more than that sitting in here right now. And he says, we're going to reach this place. So he, he uses what is around him. He uses what's around him. You know, sometimes we don't understand how we're going to do the things that we're going to do. And we forget that God has put everything that we need around us. One of um, Kay's boss at seminary, Dr. Waller, was talking about his experience when he was in seminary. And they would say, well, we don't have a trumpet player. Dr. Waller's pastor would say, it's in the harvest. It's in the people that are around us. If we will go tell them about Jesus, the trumpet player is out there. They go, well, we don't have this. His response was, it is in the harvest. And the reality is, either God has already put the other Christian around you, or he's put the other people around you. See, they're always there. The thing is that in the midst of all this, Paul is struggling. He's like, you know, we just got ran out of Corinth. The people in the temple, they weren't very welcoming. And by the way, this happens in church today. Can and I told part of our story in small group today of standing up and all of a sudden it's not going great because somebody's mad because I said something at a school board meeting. It's going to happen. But we have to trust God to use our gifts and our talents where we are and what we're called to for the passions that we have. And we have to trust him for the harvest. I would like to say most of you are old enough to remember what a Billy Graham crusade was. You might have seen one on television. Most of you. Okay. Dan Smith's dad actually worked, when next time Pastor Dan's here, his dad actually worked in the Billy Graham Crusades. Okay? I wish that an altar that I preached at looked like one of those. Hannah will explain later. The Billy Graham Crusade. I wish that we didn't know what we were going to do and there were three services here every Sunday. Y'all are going, you're crazy, John. But I have to trust God for the part that we have. And you and I do. He calls us to go and serve. Remember back in, in Romans 12, he said, hey, go and serve according to your faith, no matter where you are. You go serve. It's God's response. It's God's peace of whether Kay responds or not. Hmm. More often than not, I think I, I put somebody's response somebody else's response on my actions. Now, the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, the Trinity in one has called you to be faithful. I like picking on Wendy. I wish I could tell you I knew Garrison was going to claim Jesus and stand right here and jump up and down. Because I love me some, G. I I love me some Garrison. I love Mackenzie. Eli. Abby. But you know what? None of you parents get to choose for them. They have to choose. We have to be faithful as parents. They choose. And so with you in your happy spot, you go and do what God has called you to do. Be faithful. Let God worry about it. Hmm. So you've got to find a happy spot. You've got to use what is around you. You have to trust God for the harvest. The thing is that with Paul, he's going to go on if we understand our New Testament, he's going to go on three different missionary journeys. He gets old, he's blind, 
he wants to see Rome, he ultimately does get there. Just not how he thought. Somebody asked me, they said, do you think Paul would have ever stopped? Nope. If Paul hadn't been in prison and stuck in Rome, there would have been a fourth missionary journey to write about. And when he got done with four and he healed up enough, he would have done five. I don't know why the man ever got on another boat. He was shipwrecked three different times that we read about. But I think because he understood his passion, he understood what God had called him to be, there would have been another boat in his future, there would have been another missionary trip in his future. Because he understood and he was using the gifts that God had given him. Hmm. So where are you? Then passion never stops, does it? Paul understood who he was and he didn't stop. Y'all know my mom was a teacher? My mom is now 75 years old. She stopped teaching in 2002 or three. Can't remember which. Okay. The thing is, my mom is still a teacher today. If Amanda said, Eli needs help with math, my mom would drive from Piedmont to help Eli with his math. Hey, Eli. See, it doesn't stop. Okay? I get the sneaky feeling when I retire, somehow I'll still preach. It may not be standing in front of somebody, but it'll still be doing what I do. How is it, give me the big idea, Matt. How is it to, have, do you know you found your passion, that place that God has called you, and are you serving? I wish I knew that I had somebody with a gift of hospitality that would say, hey, John, I'll help you. I got this gift of hospitality and open home. I'd be like, can we start another small group in your house in the evenings? Yes. By the way, Pixie and Cam, they do that every week by themselves. They don't right now, they're out in a week off. If you understand your passion, there's a place for you to serve. And maybe I don't have, a, have thought of it. That's very possible. But the reality is God is calling you to find, make sure you know your passion and that you're using it, that there's a place to serve. That's a better wording. Know your passion and use it. There's your big idea. That one didn't work so well. Know your passion and use it. And when that happens, then the things that the church at Ephesus will go on for a long time. The church at Corinth went on for a long time, even though Paul got ran out of both of those towns. What's the passion that God's given you? How are you using it? That's the question for today. And if you need help figuring that out, I'll be glad to help you sort that out. Because the thing is, he said, if we're tying all these pieces together, he said, hear from the Spirit. Hear a word from God. And help us to respond in a way that would please him. Knowing your passion and using it. Let me pray for you. As Jeff comes, we're going to move toward our ending. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I pray that we might be passionate about who we are. Passionate about who you've made us to be. And that we might be able to use those gifts for you and for your glory. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Son and sending the Spirit who calls us and gives us grace and mercy and faith. Amen.